Jewish traders settled in Manchester over 200 years ago. It's now the fastest growing community in Europe. We're leading up to the festival of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. It's when Jews symbolically throw away their sins and fast for 25 hours. Even Jews who don't observe any other festivals will refrain from work. Joel Lever is hosting his end of Yom Kippur party. Are we all hungry? Ian, have you been fasting today? Yes. Good, good, lovely. <laughs> Today's the Day of Atonement, so we've fasted all day, we've been to the synagogue, now everyone's come to break the fast. And some of my Muslim friends, they fast for uh, a month, and it's fantastic, we only have to do it for a day. And so who, who's the lucky ones there? You have to... Repent for all your sins. Mm, we've so got a lot. We've we? got a lot of sins. Yeah. So what we're going to do shortly is we're going to go and find a lake somewhere and we're going to throw ourselves in it, <laughs> cleanse our bodies of all yeah. the sins, and then yeah. jump out again. Yeah, and then we're done for another then we're year. We're done for another year. We can start again. The hardest part is the fasting, though, because we do like our yeah. food, don't we? Yeah. Twenty-five hours is a long time. Any room for a little one? I'm not a religious person. I know what I should do and what I shouldn't do, but I think at the end of the day, if you're a good person, you've got everything. I love Strudel. I went to a Jewish school, but we were never religious. I had a bar mitzvah. I remember wearing a brown flared suit, big flared trousers, and they had to uh, cover me platform shoes. I loved that suit. I took a little pouch with me, with my sins, but there were neighbours passing me with wheelbarrows. It was unbelievable. <laughs> Religion is a faith, and I've been born into that faith. And yes, you're proud of your heritage, but we live in a modern era. With over 30 holidays a year, only the most religious Jews fully observe them all. Five days after Yom Kippur is Sukkot, the Jewish harvest festival. Full observance demands buying a bundle of leaves and a rare citrus fruit known in Hebrew as an esrog. To be Jewish is, is part of your life, not part-time, it's full-time. It's living by a set of rules which have been laid down. That's what you aim for if you want to be fully Jewish. But all of them are different prices depending on the quality of the esrog, without blemishes and... That's a nice one. But these have all got pitams, which is that. And that's quite delicate. If that's knocked off, that invalidates it completely. You might as well not have one. You might as well have a lemon. There's no price limit on devotion. The very best esrog can cost hundreds of pounds a piece. It's, it's 220 pounds. Show me the cheapest lull of an esrog you've got, cos I'm a cheapskate. You could have this, this is the basic one. I'll do a half price. Which is? 30 pounds. Is that the cheapest you yes, do? I don't do less. Right, I want, no, I'll just this time, I'll, 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 just this time. Splash, I'll splash out. Would I pay 500 pounds for a soft fruit? I'd rather a leather jacket. The esrug is one of four plant species required for succus. The others are willow, myrtle, and a palm leaf called a lulav. It's the one here. It's actually it's closed, but it's got the leaves goes like this. If you wanted something which is top of the range, the Rolls Royce of a lulav, you could be talking a hundred pounds. So as we said, it's not cheap to be Jewish. <laughs> it always comes with a price tag. Anyhow, so that is the ultimate test of faith, I think, to see how much you're really going to be willing to part with. What's your cheapest? Right. <laughs> Are you looking for one for yourself? Yeah. Look at that. Beautifully closed. Each and every single leaf over there, they're all fantastically closed. You've got yourself a lovely little... OK. Please, don't hit anyone hard with this. Now, this costs 60p from Tesco's. And this, as we've just seen, costs anything from £25 to £300. That's what they call Jewish inflation. 
Sukkot serves as a reminder of the 40 years the Jews wandered the desert after leaving Egypt in biblical times. The more religious choose to spend eight days under the stars in a flimsy hut. My girls at work say to me, are you sitting in a shed? But like, when I'm sitting in a shed, they mean suckers. What? I said, yeah, we eat outside in our shed for a week. We open a roof, we put all fancy chains on it, and they think we are absolutely mad. But we do, and the boys sleep in it. My boys sleep in it. Our little sucker. It's not part of the house, we have it outside. Yeah, Much better to be in my sucker than watching X Factor. I mean, my sucker isn't very big, so I can only have about eight or ten people in it. But we drink and we joke and we laugh and we sing. I'm a very busy person and I'm probably the exception to most orthodox Jewish women because a lot of them just do stay at home and make a challah and, you know, go to neshama people. I don't, I have to do everything. It's not men only. Everything's men only. This isn't men only. If it wasn't for the women, who would make the holiday? Well, that's what we do. Yeah. All starve. we do is cook. We'd starve without the women. The Manchester Jewish community prays hard and plays hard. Jewish unity is also one of the themes of Sukkot, drawing together Jews with different levels of knowledge and observance. It's just about giving the kids a good time. That's all it is. Look, I've got nothing against customs and traditions which doesn't interfere with the next person. I know I'm not observant, but I don't feel guilty. Retired businessman Jack Eisenberg lost his faith after surviving the Holocaust. Now he spends much of his time telling schoolchildren about his experiences. You see, Auschwitz had a selection system. They selected people to work and the rest to the gas chambers. Jack was 19 years old when he came to Manchester in 1945, just one of 300 Jewish orphans who survived the horrors of the Holocaust. They're a dwindling band of brothers, and every week Jack meets up with fellow survivor Sam Laskier. If I have rice, I don't want chapati, do I? You know what I like, don't you? Food was created by God. Where does kosher come into it? <laughs> well, I know from experience, the worst thing in life, the biggest pain is being hungry. The biggest pain? Yeah, it's hungry, yeah. Well, let me tell How you. can any of us complain what hunger is? You can't explain it. <laughs> no. You've got to feel it. Uh, yeah. If you're hungry, you submit to anything, anything. You do anything for a piece of bread. We came over together in 1945. We were about 30 of us in Manchester, and we always kept together. But unfortunately, there's not many of us left. I am a survivor. I don't mind being called a survivor. I was tattooed. Yeah, I've got a tattoo on my arm. The trauma that has not gone away, it'll never go away. I think I'll live with it for the rest of my life. Still haunted by the experience, Jack wants to return to Poland to find out why he was the only survivor in his family. Lechaim. That's where we differ. I don't want to go to Poland. I've been once. I saw where I lived. We went to Treblinka. I was in Auschwitz. And this is it. That's for me, it's enough. But to me, to go to Stashov, I could live there. Because that's where I was born. That's where my parents were. And I sometimes experience, honestly, I must tell you, I'm in the gas chamber with them, and I don't mind. And you don't mind? No, because I embrace them. They are struggling for breath. I'm struggling for breath. Yeah. Finish. Yeah. We all gone together. Well, because I'm here so there you are, because yeah. of my father, who said, Jack, maybe you should, we should split, and you should go into hiding. 
That's why I'm here. That's how you survive. The fact that we are still sane and we're still here is a miracle in itself. For many Jews in Manchester, there's one place they truly feel at home, Israel. Burnett's daughter, Leanne, has lived there since she got married. Now she's got news for her mum. We're going to Israel to see the new baby, please, God, and we're going to see Simon, Leanne, and two gorgeous little boys, and we're on our way. Give me I'm a not kiss. on camera, I'm not oh, Oh, for God's sake. Probably the one and only in 25 years. Bye-bye. Bye. Have you gone now? <laughs> See, my daughter's lived there for three years and I've been to see her on loads of occasions with the little boys and her way of life is not like it is here for me, but that's what she's chosen. That's their life. I hope they come back then. I don't care how they're happy, I want them home. Mm. This little car gets to Israel. Well. This will be a last road trip. I'm going to be going down with it. I think most Jewish people have Jerusalem at the heart of their lives. It's the heart of our prayers, and I don't think we should be embarrassed because of it. Israel's our country. It's where we can feel at home in. We haven't got a problem with the food. You're with a fellow Jew and that's how it is. It's much easier to be there. A lot of the commandments are only appertaining to the land of Israel. So living outside Israel, you're not a fulfilled Jew. To me, it's a holiday place, it's fun, it's very, very modern. Clubs, restaurants, it's a young country and it's a fantastic place to holiday. But it's no holiday for Burnett. She's come to Israel to help her daughter's family. They live in one of the most orthodox areas of Jerusalem. This is Hanoff, very, very, very religious area. Nobody has a television, no one has a video, so you won't see my daughter or the grandchildren on this programme. They actually live up there on the third floor in an apartment, really, really nice. This is my usual trip here when I'm with my daughter, shopping, cooking, helping her, making chicken soup. You can't be without the next mummy's chicken soup. New baby nappies. Everything's kosher in the supermarket. It's a lot easier, I don't have to check. I just buy it. If most people now are moving more to the right, where they are becoming much more religious. My daughter and son-in-law, to other people that are like my friends at home, would say she's more orthodox than me. She wears her hair covered, I don't. And he learns in the yeshiva, my husband doesn't, he works. So cute. They have about a thousand babies, bless them are born a month here, yeah. which is a lot of babies. So every other shop is a baby wear shop. That's how it is. What a kerfuffle. Uh, in England, at least I'd have a car to get about in, but this is an absolute joke. We've got three, she's on the third floor, we've got three flights of stairs to get to. Back in Manchester, Joel Lever is getting into shape for a hard day on the front line of fashion. Be careful what's underneath, it's very, very frightening. Oh, Saturday morning, come in here, transform yourself, ready for the day. Go on, you can do it vigorously, pretend I'm in a washing machine. I'm not thinning out, am I? No. Are you sure? You tell me. Well, I'm a self-made man. I was 15 and I went to work for a department store in Manchester and they started me on the baking counter. Nice Jewish boy, works in a baking counter. So, I think I was drawn to fashion. I buy, I sell, I design. If I can earn money, I'll do it. To coin a Jewish phrase, I'm in the schmatter game. You beat me to it! You beat me to... There's always a wedding, there's always a bar mitzvah, there's always a bat mitzvah, there's always something. Jewish people love clothes. This is a mezuzah, it's a good luck charm. And every Jewish household has one. And you put them on the side of the door and it's got a scroll inside. 
I have one on every door in the house. Um, most Jewish people do. Based in the heart of North Manchester, Mon Ami has been catering for fashionable and frum ladies for 25 years. You've had quite a few religious ladies in this week, but one thing religious women don't wear, they don't wear reds, because red draws your attention to a woman. Yeah, no, you can have red hair, you can have a red shade, Lucia. In fact, to take this, let me take this off. <laughs> that is stunning. You can put a black top under that with sleeves and then it becomes kosher. I think a lot of Jewish people are in the rag trade because it comes naturally to them. Um, and if you've got a little bit of a flair about you, you're good at it. Do you know my favourite tune? What's that? The singing of the till. <laughs> Why did I not know? How does it go? Do we know that tune? Ka-ching! 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 Oh dear, she's heavy. She must have ate well. We cater for everyone. Isn't that fab? We start from birth right through until exit time. I don't do shrouds, but I do everything else. How do I look? I've always been a businessman. Uh, I was about eight or nine, and there was a lady who lived across the road from us, and she used to sunbathe in the back garden. Of course, she was topless, and so I charged the other kids in the street a penny, and I helped them onto the garage roof, and we all used to peer over. This yes. is my Irish mother. And that is my Jewish son, that I've known for a long time. So how long have you been with us? Oh, I've known you 28 years. She's a marvellous sales girl. People uh, come here to see you. You're like a monument. That is awful. <laughs> no, well, you are. People come here. You get presents bought for yes, you. Yes, I do, of course. You get presents. Yes. They come in to see how you are. And when they come in to see how you are, they spend money. They spend money. And you all love the sound of that, too. <laughs> Most of my girls now are late 50s, early 60s, and they come to work because they enjoy it. The customers love them, and we do, we work as a big family. The Jewish race has been going thousands of years, and yes, you're proud of your heritage, but we live in a modern era, and what they used to do in the desert 5,000 years ago, they did because they knew no difference. Joel's shop has always traded seven days a week, but now he started to get angry letters from the religious community about opening on the Sabbath. There are many Shoma Shabbat people, either unaware that your clothing store is Jewish owned, they would feel sick and disgusted knowing that they are supporting a store which is open on the Shabbos. Um, I believe in live and let live and I get infuriated because what they try and do is they try and turn me into being more religious. I don't want to be more religious. Right, what are we doing? What do we do? Well, the more religious people observe Shabbos by totally downing tools. Some people don't turn a light on, they don't drive, they don't do anything that is mechanical. Yeah, everything's ready. What about the payers? You leaving them a bit longer? No. No? I'll cut them. Cut them just to the bone? Yeah. OK. I don't work on a Sabbath now. Used to be, I never observed it at all, and I used to work on Sabbath. And maybe it's influence of me be working... ..working down in this area and, and, and being amongst Jewish people. You've been friends with people for 25, 30 years. Now, obviously, they're non-Jewish, they're Christian, this, that, the other, and then they invite you around and say, ''Hey, Clive, we're having a meal or we're having this.'' And then the other you say, I'm sorry, I can't come to your house anymore. What do you mean? Why? Because I've suddenly gone religious, I've suddenly eaten kosher food and whatever like that. Uh, oh, right. That to me is a no-no. You know, you can't do that to people. OK, young man? Very good. I know about Chabbis because I was brought up to the age of 13 in that religious atmosphere. Family, religion, that, that was their life. Jack Eisenberg's life changed with the outbreak of the Second World War. He lost his family in the Holocaust, but he survived to make a life in Britain. Now he's going back to visit his past. We are going to Poland, Stashov, 
the town I was born. Because don't forget, I am the only survivor of the small family, of the four of us. I can ask myself the question, why me? Why not the others? Jack was born in 1926, one of three and a half million Jews living in Poland. At the time, it was the largest Jewish community in Europe. Stashov will always be in my heart. That's where I live with my parents and my little brother, Schmelke. We lived here. This was my grandfather's shop. He lived upstairs. And downstairs he had like a food, food shop. In 1942, Stashov was a town of 12,000 people, half of whom were Jews trapped in a ghetto. This used to be the synagogue. And this square was 99% Orthodox Jews. Avenir Pamiętacie Familie Eisenberg. After three years of occupation, the Nazis ordered the evacuation of the ghetto, a day known as Black Sunday. And that's where the bridge was. The day before, Jack's father Isaac took his family to the river and gave him a choice that would save his life. My father said to me, look, you're the oldest son. You don't have to say yes. It is up to you what you want. I suggest you don't come with us. Why? Because in case something goes wrong. That evening I went into the hiding, into the attic. That's it, that was the last time. Makes you sick. Yeah. The following day, his family were among 7,000 Jews sent to Belsek extermination camp. Out of the train, undressed, and straight to the gas chamber. Yeah. And I tell you, that's what happened to my family. There are no Jews left in Stashov today. Jack, one of a handful of survivors from the town, has never forgotten the family he left behind, especially his little brother, Schmelke. He was nine years old. Gashed. What kind of a world is that? What has he done wrong? Yes, yes, he was a Jew. That's what his guilt. He was a Jew. <laughs> In Jerusalem, there's nothing quite like a Jewish wedding, whether you're invited or not. You just go with the flow here in Jerusalem. Everyone just turns up at weddings and they just go. Once you dress the party, it's fine. Picture this wedding where it's the nearest and dearest. Me, from Manchester. I haven't even been invited. The next thing, push me in, dance with the bride. I just thought, Bennett, what are you doing? Burnett's Manchester has a handful of kosher shops. In Jerusalem, there are whole districts. Many are settled by ultra-Orthodox Jews from Eastern Europe, but there's always a few friends from home here as well. From Manchester, my friend's daughter from Manchester, Talia. My upbringing was very religious. My mum never wore a shaitl, but it wasn't like it is today. First of all, you have to be quiet, not. You have to wear a shaitl, don't. Uh, and that sort of thing. So I, you have to fit into this sort of little box. If you don't cover your hair with a wig, you can look quite cute and trendy with a scarf. Oh, my God. You have to have a nice face to do this, don't you? You have to look nice. Oh, I can't wear that. Oh, I look like I'm frying fish or something. I look like I'm making chicken soup. Oh, no! What about the ones that go like that? Oh, I just love it! Do you like this? 
Huh? If you live in Manchester, you wouldn't take it off. You'd wear that on your head all the time. Geshem, 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 Anglia. The more religious areas of Jerusalem have strict rules of modesty, dictating not only dress codes, but also the segregation of men and women. I have been on a road where there's been women on one side and men on the other side. In fact, somebody said to me, if I saw my middle boy in the street when he was in your shiver. Do not hug him, do not go near him. But that's what they're like. You have to really respect them. Yeshivas are men-only colleges of Jewish learning. Israel has become the place to be for many religious boys from Manchester. Well, a yeshiva is basically a college where you would spend up to 10 hours a day studying mostly the Talmud, and areas of Jewish law. And therefore, it sets you up for life because you get a good knowledge before you get married, and then you know how to run your own home, bring up your children, supposedly. Thousands and thousands of boys are there all learning in these white shirts, and it's like a uniform with the black suits and the black hats. This is my Gabby's friends from Manchester. Gabby, um, they're coming here for, to looking for girls, I think. I've been here since August 29. Um, I've been in yeshiva here. We start at 7:15. Gabby, we do have a break in the afternoon for about two hours. Uh, oh, I couldn't this, do that. This is a solid day. That's why women don't do things like that. We just make bread. Do you miss Manchester? I miss the friends that are still there, but I love it in Israel. Absolutely love it here. We're slowly losing gorgeous boys. It's going to be just me, myself and I. Yeah, we'll be back then. It's a new thing now. A boy should go into try and do some learning before university. My youngest one's going in July. We're going to start off for two years. Could be six, could be seven. Gabby asked for a souvenir. I could bring him back a potato cooker. I don't want to say I'm going to lose my son, because I won't. But a lot can get into the system and they don't come out. The heads of the fish, you have that on Rosh Hashanah. Ooh. Parents will see them once or twice a year, and they'll be married. Shidduch, dum, dum, finished. Joel Lever keeps kosher on his regular visit to Manchester's oldest Jewish bakery. I don't think there's any chance of my children wanting to go on a yeshiva or a seminary in Israel because we don't live that sort of life. All right, Mars. Yeah, you're going to make some bread with Emma and Ollie. My children have been brought up in a kosher home and they're taught everything they need to know about Judaism. As they grow older, then it depends what path they want to take. They might want to go religious and they might want to not be religious. OK, get your three strands. You do a plait like that, yeah? Oh. <laughs> challah bread defines a Jewish religion. Friday night is nothing without challah bread. I mean, to have a challah on the table is very, very important. Do I like challah? Do I look like I <laughs> don't eat bread? I love challah, yeah. There we go. Lovely fresh challah. I think that um, understanding the food that's associated with the Jews is very important, but I think more important is understanding the religion. For the non-Jewish person looking into Jewish life, and it must be really, really confusing for them. And I think for a Jewish person being involved in Jewish culture, I think it's just as confusing. When did you know you wanted to be a master baker? From about 11. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, all to the car. Just have a look in the mirror. She likes what she likes, but at night she gets all her clothes out, don't you? And you lie them all out ready for the next day. She's going to take over Daddy's business, aren't you? Turn around. A lot of Jewish people are in the rag trade because it's inherited, because the parents were in it. So when a lot of the immigrants came to England, uh, they were in the rag trade. I don't really want my kids to follow in my footsteps. I think it would be a lot easier for them if they had a profession. Yeah, stunning. Well, do you fancy her in it? I fancy her in a bin bag. <laughs> <laughs> What's 
You don't mind me putting my hand up your skirt? Joel is still getting complaints from the Orthodox community for opening on the Sabbath. He's decided to respond with a letter of his own. I get these poison pen letters, I get nastiness, uh, and I don't like it, and I've, I've had enough of it. And that is the letter that I've written to the paper. Not nasty, not horrible, it just covers how I feel. Keeping kosher is a lifetime commitment. Newlands is a Jewish care home, and their kosher credentials are in the hands of part-time rabbi Zevi Saunders. My dad is a rabbi. I watched him and followed him around, and people were saying they thought I had the skills, and, and then I got a job as a junior minister, and I just thought, OK, well, I might as well become a rabbi. Hello, ladies. You all all right? Afternoon, Sybil. Hello, Betty. Some rabbis have to do a lot of pastoral work, go visiting people. Some rabbis have to lead the services. Some rabbis don't. Keeping the kitchen kosher means checking eggs for blood, vegetables for insects, and even lighting the gas. Because it is age-old Jewish tradition that Jewish people should cook for Jewish people. Jews do not eat bugs in their fruits or vegetables, so as lettuce is, well, sometimes riddled with little bugs, I'm first of all soaking them in salt water, and then I will inspect it by the sunlight, if there is any left. Maybe that's why Jews love eating more than drinking, because drinking is easy, you just take out a bottle and drink. Whereas here, we have to show love and affection to our food. So far, they're quite clean. Let's all check for dirt at the tops. Oh, that appears to be a small little creature of some sort. Not anything exciting, we've never found a snake or uh, anything. Rabbi's job is to be nosy, stick his nose in, whether it's called for or not, to see how things are really going. So I like to say, as a rabbi, you've got to be a Jacob's Ladder kind of a guy. Yes, your head can be in the clouds, but you've got to have your feet firmly on the ground. You live in this world, you've got to know what's going on. <sighs> job done. For thousands of years, the Word of God has been written down in Torah scrolls and parchments. Even today in Manchester, the work of a scribe is far from obsolete. The head of the academy in which I was studying gave me an option of the three categories, the scribe, the Jewish slaughterer, and the circumciser. And, of course, I don't really like the sight of blood. But on the other hand, writing, yes, that sounds very interesting. And, uh, yes, I would like to follow that, please. And, obviously, the rest is history. The whole thing is labour from beginning to end. It makes it of no consequence, because even one letter can invalidate the whole rigmarole. Of course, if it was to become invalid and that person was to wear these tefillin for the next 30, 40, 50 years, then the sin by not having kosher tefillin would not be his fault whatsoever. It would all be my fault. So, as I say, that is a burden which is very, very heavy to carry. We met in my sister's house and then we knew it was right and we got engaged. After two meetings, two days... <laughs> And we have been married for 34 years, but I ain't her. And it couldn't be better. <laughs> After having written for 30 odd years, I'm afraid I would need a long time to calculate how many I'd actually written in that time. But suffice to say, uh, many, many hundreds, if not thousands, of mezuzahs over that period of time. Our youngest son is Zachariah, who's married to Hannah. I would have liked at least one of the children to, to have become a scribe, but no, none of them was interested. The consensus amongst them was that it's too solitary and they're social creatures and, and they felt that it just wasn't for them. It's Monday morning at the Western Wall in Jerusalem. This is the holiest Jewish site in the world. Jewish people worldwide face this wall in their prayers. I'm going to go down the right-hand side because it's a lady section. We can't be with the men. So I've got to put my note in, got to give us a docker, say a few of my davening, my prayers, and then I feel better because that's what Israel's about. You all, everyone comes here. 
I'm putting my little note into the wall because that's what I want to do and it's bright yellow so maybe it'll be answered on the prayers. I think Jewish people have been hated over the years. I can't answer the question why. My boys have occasionally been out in the city centre and had a school cap flicked off the head. But we just think it's ignorance. We think that there's not enough knowledge of what it is. I've had a swastika drawn in the ice on my car. I've had Jew written on the side of my car, which I thought, oh, yes, I am a Jew. Quite correct. How did they know? In the Jewish prayers, there is mention, we the chosen people, I want to be not chosen. I wish I was in my passport, nationality, human race. In 1942, 16-year-old Jack Eisenberg escaped certain death by hiding. He was discovered after two weeks and sent to Kielce in Poland as a slave worker for a German armaments factory called Hasag. So, Bu Hasag. It's behind the building, left. This used to be Hasak, and that's where I worked for nearly two years. You were not classed as a human being. No water, no heating, and if they thought you're not fit to work anymore, so they killed you. The future, if it there was a future, I could have been collected again in the last minute, put on a train into an extermination camp. 18-year-old Jack's luck ran out by the winter of 1944, when he was put on a cattle train to Germany. And they pushed it in like sardines. All the people started falling on top of me. And very soon I was covered with bodies, and I had to dig myself out. And then two days later, we arrived in Buchenwald. It's Burnett's last night in Israel, and she's come to say goodbye to all her friends. Most are from Manchester, and they've all exercised their right in Israel's law of return to settle here. Would you like some soup? Most of these people here tonight are attached to Manchester. Manchester, 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 husband Manchester. Oh, I miss Martin Spencer. When I'm in Israel, we have the most amazing, wonderful friends that all lived in England. They just make me and Michael one of the family. <laughs> this is my home ground. <laughs> Full stop. Full stop. <laughs> Not is. No. It's a bit too heavy mob for me, but it's fine. It's a bit more ultra orthodox. Yeah. We're more more like Burnett, mm. modern orthodox. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can see Michael. It's funny you see Michael into black leather. <laughs> it's quite hard to be in both worlds, but you have to be. And some very religious people can't. They think the world should be made up of. Jewish people, Jewish shops, Jewish people, Jewish clothes, Jewish this, Jewish that. It isn't. Even in Israel, not everybody's the same. You can't. When people say you've not come back suntanned, suntanned! I need a holiday when I come back. Three of them under the age of two. Please God, Leanne will have lots of babies. Whatever Hashem gives her, she will have. That's what they believe in, that's what she wants. I'm not having them, I'm not bringing them up, she's doing it, and it's not for me. I'm the mum. Keep shtub. Uh, is that just for the camera? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. He sees jumping with the excitement when he sees me. For Joel, it's just another day fighting the flab. Morning. Yeah, with ten minutes of keep fat. <laughs> but nice and tense. Keep it that? tight. This is what I like. Of course. Easy exercise. Don't need to take my jacket off. No. Oh, my shoes. <laughs> well, I'm trying to lose a bit of weight, the lazy man's way. 
unfortunately, I'm a foodie, and being Jewish, mm -hmm. you know, the food's very nice. And do you know what? I, I can feel trousers slightly looser. Three, Three two, two, one, one gone. gone. Uh, today it's Una's birthday and she's 80. She's wonderful, she's fantastic. Uh, Una's been with me virtually since day one. one my God, there's only two oh. Una is my Irish second mum. Uh, she's fantastic. It's not often you find someone like this, you know. And he's tried to, he's tried to get rid of me ever since. <laughs> <laughs> Me letters in. Oh right. Me letters in. Um, and it's titled "Customer said Rabbi had told her to avoid my shop." That's terrible. Yeah, it's terrible. But you know, again, it's rules for one and rules for another. It's not getting more religious. I just think there's more religious people about um, because the community is growing. Alongside a growing Jewish community is a boom in betrothals. This is a wedding invitation that's happening tomorrow. Right? That's the next invitation. That's happening in four weeks. A wedding invitation. That's another wedding invitation that's happening in two weeks. This is an, an engagement invitation that's happening next week. So all the things that we're getting invited to, that's all we do. Tonight, Burnett is going to Rabbi Zevi Saunders' engagement party. It's a romantic story. His fiancée, Erica Corman, is American. And in order to seal it all, we do it in an old traditional way by Kenyan Suda. I'm giving you something which is a piece of a garment. First one to marry her, be sure to have a be a good husband to her, care for her, cherish her. Just as breaking the plate is a final gesture, so too is their engagement. Oh, I'm so excited for these two. Oh, oh. How did you meet? We met on the internet. Internet dating. We, uh, I sent an email on a Jewish dating website. And then I ignored him. And then, because I saw a rabbi and he's from Manchester, that's so far away, forget it. I'm not going to respond. She turned me down on two websites, and the third one I got her. And I thought, oh, British, British accent. Well, that's also always really cute. Well, I like your accent. <laughs> <laughs> About four or five of the girls that I've been out with, uh, I think I've always been dumped. No, once I ended it, but all the other times they ended it with me. No, she didn't want to do that all. No. Somebody once mentioned to me that they think people find me overpowering. <laughs> perhaps. And dominating. Not in a bad way, but sort of, you know, sort of very overbearing, perhaps. Yes. Zevi was with Erica for 22 days, but they never touched. But he finally popped the question on a day trip to Edinburgh. <laughs> I asked her to marry me on the 20th of December at Edinburgh Castle. And I asked her if I could anoint her as my queen. And so, great guy. Yeah, yeah, well, it's okay. uh, And then she said yes. It's fantastic. It's very important to marry off the children, and a lot of them get married very young. And you wonder, why would a girl get married at 16 or 17? But they just do, because please God, they want them to get married and have children and keep going and keep going and more children and more children, and that's how it is. We're trying to give out the plate to all the single gorgeous girls, but there's nobody well, here tonight. Well, I'm... Uh... Weddings are a major part of our religion. We have, thank God, can I horror, a lot of Jewish weddings. No Jewish weddings, no babies. We need babies to carry on.